At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, welcome everyone to another Drug Science Podcast. This is me, David Nutt, and today I'm talking to a remarkable woman. Her name is Frederica Mikkel. She's from Switzerland. And I first met her 10 years ago when she and her husband came to my office in Imperial College to tell me about what had happened to her as a result of her pioneering psychedelic therapy. And I persuaded her to write an article for a, a journal, Drug Science Policy and Law, which is, of course, the Drug Science Journal, which she did. You can all read that. She did that with Ben Susser, uh, someone who's also done a podcast with me. And it's a great pleasure to have you talking with me today, Frederica because it was inspirational what you told me 10 years ago. And I, I want the rest of the world to learn about you and, and what you've done and why you've done it. So welcome. Thank you for the warm welcoming. I'm a little bit excited, as excited as I was 10 years ago, or even a little longer. And um, I tell you that I, I think I start with the funny thing that happened, how we uh, got to, sure. to come to you. You may, it is probably known that uh, my husband and I were because of my underground work in jail, in custody, so to say better. And when my husband was transferred from one uh, prison to the other, because when you are arrested first, you go to the police prison and then you are brought to a nicer one, you know, a little nicer. <laughs> and he was sitting in a completely closed uh, cell waiting for him to be transported. And he pressed the button in the wall and the radio no. talked about you, Dave. <laughs> yes. You know, out of nothing, he pressed this button. He never listens to the radio. So he heard that you had been sacked because yes. of the drug ranking. And he said to himself, if I ever get out here, he counted mm. on 10 years, you know, if I ever get out here, we have to go to this professor. And he remembered, reminded your name, and he kept nagging me. We have to go to see him, but I first had to have my trial. I was nervous all the time, stressed. So it took, the trial was in July, and then in November, we finally made it to you. And there we were, and I actually told the first time the whole story to someone who, who would listen to me and understand what I've been doing. And then you, you gave me two names. Do you recall that? I don't. You gave me the name mm -hmm. of uh, Ben Sessa and the name uh -huh. of Robin yes. Cahart or Harris. And both called me and I picked Ben. I, I sort of yeah. liked his voice better or something. No idea who they were. Yeah, so this is how we got to know you and how we uh, came to you. And then we... Yeah, the story went on. And you re recommended and you told me to write, to talk, and to, to whatever. And I thought, dear God, no, not ever. But actually, with your help, I did. So the thanks is all on my side towards you. That is super. So why don't you help the uh, the listeners understand a bit about who you are? T tell us about you know, who you are and your background before we get into the to your case. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm 73 years old now. I have uh, three grown-up children, eight great-children, and one and a half great-grandchildren. And um, I'm trained to be a medical doctor and trained to be uh, a psychotherapist. As a medical doctor, I had the spe speciality of labor medicine, you know, in big plants, uh -huh. you need doctors. And since I found that all, almost all uh, diseases are connected psychologically to the person's um, mm -hmm surrounding i decided to become a psychotherapist but you start from the beginning you were born in switzerland were you no 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 ah. i'm born in germany and i was married there for right. 27 years and ah. i studied in germany lived 
for a while uh -huh. in America uh, with my first husband. Then <laughs> how life plays. When I got into this crisis, I started doing other work. But let me follow the line of the uh, biography. And then I became a psychotherapist. Since I had to do my own stuff, I immediately understood that normal psychotherapy, that psych psychology wouldn't bring me any further. So I started to search what I could do. And sure enough, I ended in holotropic breathwork. Then I did hypnotherapy, systemic therapy, transpersonal therapy, behavioral therapy, did family constellation, did whatever. With the holotropic breathwork, I found the first step into my inner self. You know, being born after the war, right after the war, there was lots of stuff I had to deal with. And then via Stan Groff's talking all the time about psychedelics, and I first heard about psychedelics, no idea. Normally one thinks that when I was uh, in my younger years, I would have been a member mm -hmm. of the hippie scene, but I wasn't because I had already children when oh, I was 20. I so, <laughs> so no yeah. hippie time, no nothing, no drugs, no sex, no fun, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> but, uh, Just a handful. <laughs> <laughs> it can, exactly. So after the holotropic breath works, then actually in this last talk said to me, you know, you should go on with psychedelics. And I thought, well, psychedelics, whatever. So, and then back in uh, Germany, I stumbled uh, during a holotropic breath work uh, group I gave over a book from uh, a right. Swiss guy. And he offered a training in psychotic yeah. therapy. And I thought, I don't know what this is, but I uh, go there. Uh. So I went to him and we had a talk and he, I think he didn't very much like me, but I kept insisting and insisting. So finally he took me. And since I had already separated from my husband, my now husband as a lawyer joined this group oh. <laughs> and we had uh, 12 weekends of, I would say now, mm -hmm. self-experience sessions. And this is how I got into the whole thing, just because I was curious to really find out what's happening within me, get to know myself, no idea. I mean, this was 1992. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's long ago. And we, are, you know, we had little knowledge about practically nothing. <laughs> no email, no internet, no nothing. So that was the way. So you started off as what we would call an occupational doctor working in for people who are in in factories right. and etc and then you realize that psychotherapy was a necessary thing for you to learn and then you realize that psychedelics could potentially expand your capacity and understanding as a psychotherapist is, is that right yeah the, the yeah. holotropic breathwork yes. comes first it was the my first encounter and it helped me uh, to really get into my subconscious yes. stuff that I had wonderfully dissociated, you know, for normal yes. life. And the fact of the being able to open up yes. consciousness, and it was actually the the key to, to yes. everything else. So then you sought out this therapist, and that, that person was in Switzerland, were they? Or, or they were in Germany? Yes, it, it, um, it, it was one of the members of the foundation of the SEPT, the Swiss Association, and they split, and everything was difficult then. But the training I had at that time was very, it was profound for me. No drama, no nothing, but learning to to sit still and be mm -hmm. with the substance. And, and was that with LSD or psilocybin? Or? Uh, this was uh, with MMA, uh -huh. LSD, psilocybin, and 2CB. All right, so you're very experienced. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I see. We can yeah. come back. Yeah. So we learned about the substances and how to be with the substances. Okay. And then uh, and having done that, and, and, and your husband has, must be one of the few lawyers. He went through the same processes? Yes. Yes. See, I, I thought that if I do a deep, deep process and may change what I did, actually, then we have to share this in our relationship. So he went the way along with me and he never regretted, you know, although it was difficult for him as a lawyer. 
Yes. <laughs> so having had the experience yourself, you then realized there was opportunities with these these medicines are offered opportunities for some of your clients then is, is that right yes you know i i first always did the, the normal yep. therapy i would even in normal therapy i would invite them to do holotropic right. breath work especially when they were sort of rigid or or difficult to to into the inner world and um, then we did family constellation, but uh, the holotropic breathwork was the first. And when the client really didn't manage to get into the process, which uh, many do be when they are very rigid or very afraid or whatever, then I would suggest my special therapy. So actually, I had a selective, uh, selected clientele, uh, which were stuck and where I assumed, like I had perceived, that there were more problems behind the, the whole thing than the eye could see. So then what did you do? <laughs> yeah, I did, as a matter of fact, I did groups. It started out on another level. The story is that once I had to uh, do a holotropic breathwork uh, session in a monastery in Germany, and I talked to the Zen master constantly about uh, my psychedelic experiences I was having with this um, doctor in Switzerland. And so after a while, he said to me, you know, I have some uh, meditation students that got stuck. Can you give them an MDMA session? So I said, okay, yeah. So they came, people came to me first thing in single setting. They were very disciplined meditators, you know, who would really sit and go. Oh, it was a perfect clientele because they wouldn't, you know, go out of their minds or something. Very centered, meditative. They would follow the substance, be still for hours and hours, and then uh, smile and go to their master. <laughs> so that was the beginning. And sure, the word spread, you know, people talk all the time. <laughs> And then people would call me and say, I want to do this too. And then a little group came who wanted to do self-experiences. And I did. And then I started when more people had done it. And then I actually started offering this specialty to my clients. And by, by over the time, I only had clients, not friends anymore or so. Naturally, we all became friends. It is the, the normal way that you become on a human base, you become a friend. But this is how it started. So you started with a Zen master asking you to facilitate uh, yes. meditators. To, but, and, but you chose then to use MDMA, which is not necessarily, well, from our, certainly from the sort of neuroscience stuff we've done, wouldn't necessarily be the most obvious choice. But, but you found it helpful or they found it helpful? Yeah, they found it very helpful. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, I was a little in the beginning before I was had my own security. I, I would rather administer an MDMA because uh, it is handle. You can handle it. It opens up. It, it leaves you into your total normal mind. So this was for me this the safest thing. Yes, I can see. I can see the absolutely the the from the safety perspective. I'm sure that was a wise uh, a wise thing to start with. But I, I'm interested. That they found it helpful. That is in that in itself is interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they they understood where they were stuck or what they were, you know. So it really was helpful. <laughs> and then subsequently, you, what did you do? Did you give people a choice, or did you direct them to a particular one of your uh, medicines based on their stuckness for well, well, their personality how did you how did you manage those kind of sessions well this was uh, actually i started in 97 it really was a process over time at first i had like six or eight people and then we would do it the same way i had learned it at the training would sit up then were allowed to lie down and we would be very still all the time. Just watch them be there, take care of the space, whatever. And then more and more, especially after I started adding uh, after a while, a little LSD to the MDMA, people started getting emotions and they would call me, would go over. And so there was some rumor in the room, some noise and 
people said I was disturbed and blah, blah, blah. So after a while, I had the wonderful idea. I said, um, after like two hours, we all sit up. And so we all set up and we would, I would ask around, how are you? Where are you? And so on. And sometimes I would do a little work with the person and they liked it. They loved the interaction. We would lie down in between once and again, I would play music and these rounds got longer and longer. Well, the talking rounds. <laughs> yes, the talking rounds and, and I would do what I practically what is my credo about all this? I would do psychotherapy on the session and they loved it. So what, they would raise their hand and say, I want to work. And then I would say, okay, where are you? And we would go deeper in the process and I help them, you know, focus and dig and express. And, and then one day someone said, you know, why don't we constellate this? And I said, okay, who wants to be the mother? We called one woman sat in front of the other and she was the mother. And so the modified constellation work was born. Yes, before we go there, can you remember what doses you were using? Yeah. <laughs> what I always did is with whoever was about to join the group, I did a single session first. After, you know, when mm -hmm. I had given out my secret that I did this work, I decided to see this person on a single base before I would present it to the whole group. Because some said, okay, this was enough for me. Or some said, no, it's illegal. I don't really want to, you know. So I saw them on a one-to-one -one base first and um, always with MDMA. And then in the group, in the beginning, we always started with MDMA. And then I would add uh, like 50 micrograms LSD to it. So what would you do about 80 milligrams of MDMA? The first session was 90 or 100. Right, okay. And if they tolerated it well, I would uh, go up to 120, but never more. And the more I got to know them, the better I knew who would be too, would have too much on 220 or would be better off with 100 and so on. And people, uh, we rec they wrote it down for themselves. Then uh, the next time when we met, they would say, oh, I did well on 100. Can I try now 110. So we did that. Okay. <laughs> you managed to get your, your supplies without too much difficulty, did you? <laughs> that is a, a funny story too. When I did had the last, the last training in uh, Stan Groff's work in America, I met a guy and he offered me, actually he offered me, I didn't have to ask around to, that I could buy stuff from him. And I, uh -huh. No idea since I wasn't in the business yet. I ordered, believe it or not. <laughs> and he sent the stuff to me uh, packed into videos, audio uh, sets. Uh, okay. So I had a lot that really took me over all these years. <laughs> so right. that was not the, and it was very good stuff. He, he asked me whether it should be for normal people or therapeutical stuff. So I said, okay, therapeutical, if it's better, I take that. <laughs> and I sent him money in an envelope. So clearly, you know, you were know, breaking the law at that time, That's in terms of both ordering and, and possessing and, and dispensing, you must have weighed up the risks versus the benefits. And you clearly came down in favor of the benefits. And what was that about? Well, when I was asked first, or when I started asking uh, clients, I had a couple of sessions where I really was afraid. Mm -hmm. And so then I decided to do a session on my own and to confront my fear. Mm -hmm. And I recall this session, really, because uh, I trembled like hell. So I finally, it was like a process where I understood to be a medical doctor means to look at what is to be done. Yes, I see. It like an inauguration of me being yeah. a different medical doctor and not a psychotherapist anymore. Very interesting. Interesting. And that was again with your MDMA LSD combination, was it, or was that? Yeah, it was. It was the combination. We have been ourselves, as you know, done. We've done a lot of work with psychedelics, uh, psilocybin, LSD, DMT, and MDMA, but all separately. 
I guess it's, that must be one of the questions for us. And maybe after this conversation, we'll think more deeply about it. The, whether it would be quite interesting to, you know, to study them together like you have, because clearly you find them beneficial in combination. Yeah, it, there is a very interesting thing. It, if you take the MDMA first, then you are in this mm -hmm. open, open yep. rearm. And then uh, after two and a quarter, you take a little bit of LSD. You can feel how these two substances, one is falling a little, one is rising, and there is a meeting point. At this meeting point, it is the, as if there is nothing. And then the character of the LSD takes over, but the MDMA is still working so that one can look under the clear thing of the LSD, but the heart is still open. You get at the same equal, same theme, you get a different perspective. That's a really interesting observation. And you've made me even more <laughs> convinced that we should be, we should be studying that process. That's and I'll put my mind to what the pharmacology might be, but that is actually that is a, yeah. that is an intriguing observation. So, yeah, thank you for that. I'll uh, yeah. when they come back to you and pick your brains on what the right combination <laughs> is at some point, because that would be that would be a very interesting thing to to sort of examine in terms of yeah. brain function as well as the subjective. But it, it made you realise that to be a, the best doctor you could be, you had to do this for people. Yes, it was really my conviction. And I was there, you know, I, I did it next to my normal praxis because, you know, I, I was on the outside. I was just the psychotherapist and I did these uh, weekend uh, sessions next to this and next to uh, and the holotropic breathwork. I still offer too, and the family constellation. So they were busy years. Yes, yes, you yeah, quite. And, and your husband was supporting you and helping oh, you. Yes. And uh, you weren't alone, I believe. I think they were, you, you knew of other groups or other therapy therapists doing similar kind of yes. work. Is that right? Yes, yes. We were not very connected for, for known reasons, but uh, we would not, didn't like group hoppers, you know. Yes. Okay. So yeah. if someone uh, came to me, I always asked, have you been other places? And if he or she was, I would say, no, not me. And I would only take, uh, after a while, my own clientele. And it was word of mouth, so your clients would then talk yes. to their friends and yes. family about the benefits and encourage others. In. Yeah, and this was, in a way, it was dangerous. You know, sometimes I got phone calls asking me, oh, I hear you do groups, you know, I nearly fainted. No. Yes. But yeah. uh, at least 10 years went by without any trouble. Would people come in for a, a fixed number of sessions or how, how did you organize the duration of treatment? No. I did not have a fixed number. See, what we found over the time is that there are certain themes that are caught over time. So first they would always come with their problem, with the actual problem. Yeah. And then say, okay, I, I know there is more behind it. So they would come back. And after that, they loved it so much, they came back. <laughs> and, or, or they would really go into other the rearms of, you know, of their life and mm. past the biography and the epigenetics and then go to spiritual ways. Yeah. So actually the group evolved, I evolved, and the whole thing was yes. different yes. Than in the beginning. So I opened up a second group for the beginners because it fit wow. anymore. I see. So this, this is a big topic of discussion at present in those of us who are doing psychedelic therapy, whether to reduce the costs by doing it as a group. And clearly, you know, you've got a lot of expertise there. So tell us a little bit more about how big was the group? Oh, this was a process too. I started off with six and it grew to 12 to 16. Oh, you had a big room then? Yeah, actually two rooms together and we were uh -huh. lying on mattresses. I was sitting with my music in the middle. Uh, and two very experienced participants would sit in the corners and then, you know, and I had really educated, trained them to be very still in the beginning, you know, like the bolts, like in meditation, be centered, don't react, don't move, don't talk, don't leave the room, don't hang on to your thoughts and all this. So it, it was very ritualized, the whole thing. Even this first song was always the same. 
and then I would play the music according to the unfolding of the substance, and then really no one moved. And it got better and better. So after a while, we really, uh, I could have done without music. It was so still in the room. Oh, you use the music to sort of get everyone into the same mindset. Yes, I had my special ideas about the music and it really worked well. And then uh, after the peak, we would uh, be silent for half an another half an hour and then we would all sit up and then I would work, ask who wants to say something, work and so And the others would listen. If they wanted to, they could lie down silently. But it really was in the room when I worked that the others followed the process inside. So especially in the beginning, when there was these issues with father or mother or, you know, so they would benefit a lot from the others. And if they wanted to be left alone, they could focus on their own. So it was this was the way it was done. And naturally, they helped each other. Or well, outside of the sessions or just in the session? First, only in the sessions, and later they became friends, and you know, it. And we had some really, I tell you, we had a, I had a couple in, and they managed to separate in a very loving and peaceful way. I had had them in, in the therapy before, and finally they separated, and they are still separated and very happy, both. So they often talk about this. So we had diff very, very different issues in the room. Yeah, so I was—I mean, obviously, mostly where we are using psilocybin at present is is in the treatment of disorders, mental yes. disorders. But for you, it was more about helping people make more sense of their lives and, and improve their relationships. Was that be fair um, to say, or did you actually treat people who were depressed? You know, I never put diagnosis. I just don't uh -huh. because I—I I think if someone has a diagnosis, he can carry it around and has to learn how to get rid of it. Oh, mm -hmm. They were depressed people, and since we didn't really know at that time that it was good or for or good against depression, we just mm. we just worked. You know, whatever the problem was, we worked on it. And by picking those people that got stuck in holotropic breathwork, I had difficult cases because some of them found out that they were abused. One found out that his father wasn't his father. And so we really worked on it. We had traumatized people, which we didn't know in the beginning. But then we, we found out how to get over it by meeting, by being in a relationship, by in what I really think is important, that one implements or consolidates the findings that you have. Like, you know, you have been abused by your stepfather. So I think it's very important to, to learn in this open state that this is over and that you learn that you learn how to watch your thoughts and your feelings and then learn on the session how to deal how to think how to act differently and rehearse that on the session and this was where we really had the progress when we rehearsed a solution on the session and rehearsed it again sharing and then we had to rehearse it at home so, you know, now I know by reading and by getting myself a little smarter that we built new synaptic pathways. And that actually is what we did and what I think is important on the session so that, you know, and then be in a state where you are, where you still can stir yourself. Yeah, so you can kind of think and apply your, your intellect to the solutions as well. Apply your intellect, that's a good word, yeah. And then this was, what, once a month, twice a year? How frequently did you have these? The first three years, I did it four times a year. So I said every three months. But I tell you what, people said, we want to more, come more often. So I said, okay, every two months. <laughs> and whoever wanted to join the next session, he had to, they all had to write a protocol and had to come to see me. And then we would discuss whether the material he had seen the last time was integrated well enough, that he had changed something, and so on. And if this was the case, I would say, okay, come. And if it wasn't the case? I would say next time. You do your homework first. Okay, so, so you were kind of doing ongoing evaluation 
interacting with with them as yeah. patients, with, as yeah. a therapist, all the way. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Because, you know, I had no idea how they would change or what come up and so on. So and naturally it got more of a, on a human relationship. All day they would come at my hour, you know. Yes, yes. So that went on for several years for people, did it? Or could it? Yes. It maintained them well. Yeah. And we, the setting actually developed through the clients and me by, by feedback, by suggesting, by trying out. Mm -hmm. But the frame stayed the same. Weekend session, staying all in my house, <laughs> sleeping all yes. here. Oh, really? Are you a big house? <laughs> Hi, it's David Nutt here again. I want to take a moment to thank all of the drug science community members. In a world of paid sponsorships, political and commercial interference, drug science is and always will be independent. If you value the show as an educational resource and want to help keep us going, you can do so at drugscience.org.uk. Without our community, the dissemination of unbiased information would not be possible. By becoming a Drug Science Community member, you help to create a world where drug control is rational and evidence-based, where drug use is better informed and drug users are understood, where drugs are used to heal, not harm. Furthermore, by becoming a premium community member, you will receive a signed copy of my autobiography, access to exclusive events. At the end of the season, we will be hosting an exclusive Q&A podcast episode with all of our premium community members, where you can ask me anything. You can find out how to do this in the show notes. So now, thank you, and back to the show. Because it's very interesting, you know, say there's a lot of debate going on at present, given yeah. the fact that there's a sort of flowering of interest in and psychedelic therapy, but there's also the, the huge implications in relation to, to funding and also getting enough people, you know, therapists or guides or whatever to, to take people through. And, and also then confronted with the fact that we our own work has shown that you get a, you know, you get a good effect, but if, for people with severe chronic depression, one treatment or two treatments, not enough. And we have to think about ways of, of maintaining wellness. And your model is, a, is an interesting model. But, you know, I think, that if you really have a very severe depression, I mean, after this arrest, I had a really a post-traumatic stress disorder. So after the two years of probation, mm -hmm. I did some. And I yes. found out uh, that going through the trauma on the session is not enough. So I started out with something that might sound a little funny to you or strange, but I started to meditate with Dr. Joe Dispenza, and he, maybe you have heard the name. No, I have not, so I'm sorry. It's really very interesting. You do daily meditation and you focus beside centering and besides going into space, you focus on the future because he says we have to really set our intention with an elevated emotion, which is love, kindness, mm -hmm. gratitude, get into a, this good state and learn to watch our thoughts. So it's a, a thing between mindfulness, Buddhistic and other meditations combined with a breathing. Mm -hmm. And only in this combination, I managed to get myself out of this constant fear that uh, arose when the bell rang or when I had to go to the mailbox yeah. or so. And this really helped me to get out. So it was a combination of the psychedelics and a regular work. I think other work would have done the same, meditating, but really this daily focus on, this is a memory, this reminds me of, I'm here in the moment and all this. So I really think it's not enough. And the old surroundings and the old triggers get you back yes, the course. moment the uh, substance wears off. Yes. So look, you've touched on it now. So why don't you tell the listeners your the story of how you were arrested and what happened? If you you don't mind, yeah, if you're I up for mind, that. No, you know it's really over now. <laughs> I don't tremble anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, it is like I think I say in my book that. Being a psychotherapist, you belong to an endangered species. Uh, <laughs> so I had a woman in therapy. Her husband obviously was betraying her and she wanted a divorce. And she kept really talking very badly about this husband. So one day I said, 
why don't you bring him along? He came and immediately, really within five minutes, I found out that the relationship wasn't the problem, that but that he had a very severe other problem uh -huh. in childhood. So, yeah. and since he was a very busy man, cancelled many appointments, I offered him my speciality. And after the first single session, he was, uh, he had already a few glimpses what uh, might the problem be. And he said he wanted to continue. So I took him in the group. And after a while, I thought, okay, if he is doing the work, I should take her too. And uh, she actually didn't like the work. And so, and what I was not their couple therapist. And I hadn't, and this is where I did a big mistake. I hadn't watched their relationship. Mm -hmm. So one day he obviously got into an enormous fight with her, uh, found mm -hmm. out what she had done. And he said, I leave. And he left on the spot. And then I did the biggest mistake. I invited him to our house. <laughs> so, and this was clearly too close to her. What is to be understood? You were trying to save the marriage by bringing, asking him to bring him to your house. I thought I take her in and maybe we can work on it, but we really couldn't because he was on, on another place. He was in really the horrible loss of his father when he was nine. And he had not, they hadn't talked about it. He hadn't, you know, very, very difficult. So, and then she got so angry uh, about him having left her that she reported us to the police. And <laughs> they watched us for a year. And fortunately, oh. I had already stopped the big groups because I had turned 60 and it was hard work. So I said, okay, I stop it. So, and then they watched us for a year. They watched the telephone and the mails live for quite some time. And then they showed up in our house. One morning in the, the 29th of October in 2009, after a year of the... Surveillance, a year of surveillance. Yes. Wow, what a waste of money. And then they came and they, they arrested you. They arrested me right away. And my husband too. They searched the whole house for naughty stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, then we had to go to, we were brought to separate prisons. And then the whole story started about investigation. And what were you ch charged with? Were you charged, what, with, you were charged with drug supply or something? Or, or, or were you charged under medical regulations or what? Well, what, what happened then is the police left, very understandable, the whole story of the marriage out. They only looked at the LSD. They did not look at the MMA. And then the question actually was, is one decisive question was, is one dosage of LSD dangerous? So that was the actual question. And I had a very good lawyer who would listen to me too. <laughs> and uh, so we found a, a couple of well-known people, for example, Stan Graf, <laughs> and he wrote mm -hmm. about the dang dangerousness of LSD. And others did. Michael Winkelmann did. Um, Peter Gasser wrote. So we had several mm -hmm. big papers telling that uh, one portion of LSD wasn't dangerous because I had not given them all at once, but one at a time. This was. And then I had asked my clients, which were at that time around 35 to 40, to just write reports on to specific questions. How did you come? What did you do? What are your problems? Blah, blah, blah. And they all wrote anonymized because I hadn't given any name of any client. And so this and the reports and my being known as holotropic breathwork facilitator, with this we could prove that I had not harmed anybody. So I was taken free for the therapy, it's mentioned, but I was found guilty uh, for handing out LSD and for possessing it and for trafficking. <laughs> and for this, I got 16 months in prison on probation for two years. So just explain to us what that means. That means you didn't go to prison, but you would have gone if you broke. Exactly. I was in custody for 13 days. 
Then I was set free, mm -hmm. and I uh, this was in November, and then I had my trial in July. There, as I said, was this the judge gave this out, and then I had two years of I had to be a very good girl, which I actually was because uh, you know I really seen it. <laughs> Quite. But yeah. I, I started daring to talk about it, and this was actually my rescue. Well, that was one of the reasons I encouraged you to write your story, because it is not only a remarkable story, but also, as you know, that getting people to write things down yeah. can often be very, very therapeutic. It, it frames things in a, in a more structured way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah and the uh, interviewing of, with Ben Sessa was showing me what I did. You know, I didn't have the overview. I was just doing, you know. Yes. Mm. One of my participants always said, you have to write that down. It's unique how you do that. And I always said, don't leave me alone. I, I just do, you know. So So the, uh, the, the probation period was in, in, had one benefit. It gave you time to exactly, write. Exactly, and to recover. <laughs> yes, and yes, were, yes, yes. Yes, yes. And I, I think I should con tell you the rest of the story because... Please do. After this guy left, uh, and we had him here for a week... He had a, his own apartment, and I invited him for Easter. And there he met my daughter, who at that time was married in Germany. She was visiting us and with her children to look for Easter eggs, you know, Easter bunnies. Mm -hmm. And believe mm -hmm. it or not, they fell in love, isn't that? And, and now wow. they are married, living in Switzerland, and they have the most beautiful little son who is now 11 years old. And every time I see this enormous loving child, lovable child, I think, thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't even without this story. No, no, that is, that is truly an unexpected and remarkable <laughs> You outcome. are the first yeah. to tell, I tell publicly because I think otherwise people would say I hide something. I don't. They didn't know each other before he left. So he, he has changed. He has your therapy has changed him. It made him a, a much, much better yeah. husband and father. Yeah, he's a, a wonderful person, you know, and the child is, I love it. Oh, well, that, that is a very, <laughs> a very positive end to what was obviously an enormously traumatic yeah. time. And, and do you think your case ha has changed public opinion? I mean, clearly it was in the newspapers at the time. And, and was there a lot of sympathy for you? Yeah, the newspapers reported horribly, horribly. They tore me oh, to they? pieces. They they gave a picture that people didn't recognize me anymore who knew me, you know, as if I had done sex, love, and crime with rich people. Yeah. So totally distorted and de defamative. But, you know, all this, this is over too. <laughs> but, uh, the newspapers, I think my book is getting a little more public. And the fact that it's written now uh, in big newspapers, like the New Zurich newspaper, and they write uh, pretty uh, neutral, big headlines, you know, like trip on insurance health and so on. Well, I mean, Switzerland is very much pioneering, uh, isn't it? Yeah, you know about the compassionate use? Yes, this is excellent news. Yeah. 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 And are you yeah. still practicing or were you bar banned from medicine? No, no, I lost my license for psychotherapy here. Yes. But I work in my on my own praxis. The knowledge isn't taken away from me with the license. So I I do a breathing therapy sometimes when it when corona doesn't forbid us to breathe, we do holotropic breathwork sessions. Yeah, I still work a little, not full time. It's too much effort. And what about training? Are you training other therapists? No. No, 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 because, you know, I think for me, one has to know methods and has to know self-experience, but every single client needs to be treated totally different. So I have lots of tools and I do as the situation needs it. And this is a method one cannot teach. All I can teach is to be authentic. Yes, I, I understand that side of things. But I mean, again, this is the challenge for our field, isn't it? Trying to, how do we get other people to learn faster than we, maybe us, we have how to be good therapists in, with these rather complex and powerful drugs? And, you know, I just think you have a knowledge base which is rather special. So if we could tap into that, that would be rather good. 
Yeah, yeah. I really do think that it could only arise because I have learned so many different approaches and different views. And since I have so much self-experience, I learned how to really dig into my psyche, myself, and then uh, read new things like what you find and understand how it could apply on psychedelic work. Because if you find all this about the synapses and the, the higher and uh, mm -hmm. wire and fire, then you have to use that. How can yeah. we do that? But do you do any mentoring or anything then? No. <laughs> Well, then in that case, I'm so pleased. I am so pleased we've got you your voice <laughs> in this rather rather long but really intriguing interview. And I, I we're going to have to end now. We so I'm going to have to wind it up. I, I just is there any last thing you wanted to say to anyone? Well, what I I think you do such great research, and I wish that you could collaborate with all the people that have knowledge in other fields, and then try out what you could apply in the psychedelic sessions. I think this would be a good idea. Yeah, you're right. And that's something, you know, we're clearly, the whole question of how we optimize psychotherapeutic inputs or relax, you know, interactions in our patients who are having psychedelic yeah. therapies is, I think, it's one of the great research areas for the next decade. And I want psychologists to help us because I think, you know, they're the experts in yeah. terms of psychotherapy. But the very, maybe I say a last thing to that. I think that the relationship on the session, the deep relationship, the looking into the eye, the hugging, the confirming, you know, that this is really essential. So they get a connection to themselves and to someone out there. Yeah, that, well, that's, we will bear that in mind. And thank you all for also challenging us to do some <laughs> better science around combinations of therapy. And that, that is a very interesting question. And I, I'm going to think about that a lot. And maybe we could set up a, the right experiment, in which case I might come back to you for those optimal timings <laughs> of when we give the MDMA and then when we give the LSD. Yeah, okay. Frederica, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight to talk to you. And I'm sure there'll be thousands of people who listen to this who will understand why I think you're an absolute star. So thanks for all you've done. Thanks for surviving the traumas that yeah. society's put you through. And, and thanks for sharing with us today. Yeah, thank you, Dave. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you. Bye-bye.